for joining us today. My name is Leslie Dock, and I'm the co-chair of the Defend Democracy Project. We're two days away from the first hearing of the House Select Committee on the January 6th attack on our country. These hearings will give the media and the American public the most comprehensive look into the criminal conspiracy we have yet to see. A criminal conspiracy that President Trump and his allies perpetrated to overturn an election that they lost and that he had no legitimate chance of winning. The hearings will also show how the effort began months before January 6th and how Trump and his allies paid for and planned and incited the violence that turned into that vicious attack on our country on January 6th. Their intent to block the, the peaceful transfer of power in the United States for the first time and hopefully the last time in our history. Committee hearings will also show that this effort uh, to be able to overturn elections that they have lost continues and indeed intensifies. They are working as hard as they can, particularly at the local level, to be sure that they install elected officials whose primary goal is to put in place a mechanism so that Trump and his allies can overturn elections that they have lost and also to keep people from having the right to vote, to pick their own leaders, an essential part of the American experience. Today, our speakers will outline the ongoing threats that this poses to our country. They will present the polling data that are contrary to what we hear from Fox News, shows that people actually do care about what happened. They're worried about it, that it could happen again, and they believe people should be held accountable. They will describe the criminal conspiracy, the laws that have been broken, and the reason why accountability is necessary and deserved. And they will share with us the reaction of the American people on the ground in our communities to both these hearings and to the ongoing threat. So with that, with that let me now turn it over to Doug Jones, Senator Jones, who I think everyone here knows, um, who, uh, as a prosecutor, uh, prosecuted um, some of the most heinous crimes that we know, including two of the four men responsible for the 1963 bombing in the 16th Street Baptist Church. He then helped, uh, not that she needed much help, even from somebody as good as Doug, uh, helped um, be sure that uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson now sits on the Supreme Court as a justice in the Supreme Court, a critically important event for this country. Uh, and so now I'll turn it over to Senator Jones for his remarks. Great. Uh, thanks, Leslie. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today as we really embark on a what I think is a defining moment for this country. Uh, as Leslie said, the January 6th committee is set to hold the first uh, in a series of public hearings. They're going prime time Thursday at 8 p.m. So in preparation for that event, we thought we would hold this call to outline the significance, which we know that you know, but it's so important that we felt like that we should have this uh, call to outline the imperative nature of these hearings to important re reporters like you that are gonna be covering them and to urge everybody in the coming days and weeks to cover these hearings so that Americans can see for themselves the conspiracy that's taken place and what is at stake if we do not stop the current campaign to sabotage future elections that's ongoing as we speak, it's an important set of hearings. The select committee has been doing really unprecedented work for the past year to re reveal a holistic <laughs> of what unfolded leading up to, during, and since the January 6th attack. These hearings are gonna provide a deeper awareness of how the plot to overturn the 2020 election and the violent attack that resulted in, the Janu in January 6th was orchestrated, who was involved, and to the extent to which the threat to our elections and democracy continues today. While the committee should, in my view, continue to be as nonpartisan as possible, laying out the facts for all to see without making this investigation and the hearings appear to simply be an attack on, former, on the former president, it's important that members of the media, the free press, connect the dots so that the American people can fully understand in a non-political way, what is at stake here. This is a vital moment to show the American people how Donald Trump 
and his allies actively tried to overthrow our election system and subvert our democracy. What happened on and leading up to January 6th was literally an assault on our country. And not enough people really truly know that. Certainly not enough fully appreciate that. These hearings allow Congress to lay out the case to the American people and show how fragile our democracy actually is and that the threat is ongoing. And in some ways it is growing. We all have the responsibility to amplify the committee's important work so we can hold those responsible accountable and ensure that something like this never happens again. People need to hear the truth for themselves. The committee is simply following the facts. And what it appears to show is that Donald Trump and his allies are waging an ongoing campaign to sabotage our elections and threaten our ability to vote. Based on what we've seen from the committee to date, it appears the committee has uncovered evidence that the violence that occurred on January 6th was the inevitable result of a months long effort to overturn the election and block the peaceful transfer of power in our democracy. The committee's investigation has spanned 10 months. They've announced roughly 100 subpoenas, conducted more than a thousand interviews and depositions and received about 140,000 documents. The committee will continue to remind the public that they should watch and hear the truth for themselves and not be distracted by Trump Republicans trying to discredit the investigation and cover up their own roles in the attack, or quite frankly, Democrats who might spin the facts in some way to feather their own political nest. The people need to decide for themselves. And that's where you guys come in. I listened to a program yesterday leading up to the hearing and a former member of Congress, Secretary of Defense and CIA Director Leon Panetta said it best. The only institution that can ultimately present the truth is the free press. I'd echo that. The committee can present the facts, but it's only the free press that can uh, present the truth. And I wanna add that the free press is the first line of defense in protecting our democracy. So here are some of the facts. The attack on our country did not end on January 6th. It's only gotten worse. Trump Republicans continue to spread a deliberate disinformation campaign to sow distrust and discredit future elections. They're in changing state level laws to give 2020 election deniers final say over election results in the future, making it easier for them to overturn future elections. They're making it harder for people to vote by limiting early voting cutting down on the number of mail-in ballots and criminalizing routine practice of just giving water to people standing in line. They're supporting election deniers uh, as candidates for election administration pos uh, positions across the country and giving them more power over our election process and results. Folks, I, I believe strongly, and I've been saying this for some time, it is time for all Americans who believe in democracy, but particularly Republicans who seem to be being held hostage by the MAGA faction of their party to stand up and to help protect this democracy. We need truth telling and courage and not partisanship. So thank you so much for joining us today and for covering these hearings and for what's happening to our votes and our democracy factually and thoroughly. We appreciate your attention to all of this, and so does the American public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, let's now hear from Celinda Lake. I think many of you on the call know uh, who Celinda is. She's the president of Lake Research Partners. She's done extensive research into what the American people think about what happened on January 6th, um, why they think it's important, what they're still worried about. Um, she also, uh, is one was one of the two uh, pollsters to uh, President Biden, and in her past, amongst her clients, she uh, uh, goes uh, has both advised uh, 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 Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and Senator Tester. So she knows the spectrum of American views across this great country. Linda, thank you so much, and I'll have Sandra Markowitz uh, share with you the slides. Um, I'm really. If really I could just be granted screen shares, that would be awesome. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Thank you. 
Um, I, I really want to say what a privilege it is to be part of this group and uh, how excited we are to be releasing this data. And Senator Jones, as always, um, there's no one who's more articulate than you are. In terms of, um, this is results from a national survey of 1,200 voters. It is um, likely 2022 voters. We can get you any additional breakdowns that you're interested in. And um, it was conducted in April. Um, there are three basic points that I'll make, and then let me show you the data. The first point is that voters uh, assign remarkable importance to January 6th and are paying a lot of attention. Uh, I was frankly quite surprised by this. I did not think with everything else on their plates and how fleeting the public's attention is that this would be such a major issue, but it's really penetrated their consciousness. Number two, people see the attack on our country and they see it beyond January 6th. They see events leading up to and after. They see it as a crime and they want to hold the people involved, whether they were supporting, encouraging, paying for, planning, um, or supporting after the fact, they want to hold them accountable. And then they have a very defined sense of what they consider the crimes and what they consider the appropriate punishment. And I'll show you all of that data. So first off, 68% of the voters say that this is an important issue. 41% very important. Um, Democrats overwhelmingly think it's important, including surge Democrats, the Democrats who have uneven turnout and don't usually show up in uh, off year elections. And independents are very um, focused on this event as well, this set of events. And again, they look at it as a whole set of events before and after, and they perceive it very strongly to be overturning the will of the people. If we look at the next slide, 70% of the voters say they have seen, heard, or read about the congressional investigation. And this again was in April, 77% of Democrats and two thirds of independents and Republicans. That is remarkable penetration, um, especially given all of the things that are going on in people's lives right now. And particularly remarkable among independents who usually don't pay that much attention to what's going on in Washington. If we look at the next slide, people are very concerned um, about the attack on the country and they see it as an attack on the country, not just a, a one shot deal or one day's events. And most important, they are very concerned about future attacks and the potential for future attacks. It's one of the reasons they want those responsible uh, to be held accountable. 56% of the voters say that they are concerned, 29% very concerned. And among Democrats, you can see it's net 70% concerned. Among independents, net 25% concerned. If we look at the next chart, 73% of voters say it's a crime. 67% say it is very much a crime. This very well describes what's going on. Only 20% say it's not a crime. Democrats, it's a universal belief that it's a crime. Strong among independents and even Republicans by 18 points say net that it, this is a crime. If we look at the next chart, uh, people are willing to take this action to the voting booth as well. They say they would be less likely to vote for your member of Congress if he or she supported the people who attacked our Capitol on January 6th. And we have asked this in a variety of other ways. People also less likely to support candidates who supported the people or supported the attacks, less likely to support people in their states as well, state legislators, governors, secretaries of state, et cetera. Every group of voters less likely to vote for someone who um, was supportive of these attacks or encouraged these attacks. If we look at the next slide. People think there were a number of actions that are a very dramatic concern. Uh, Democrats rank almost everything dramatically, but independents um, very concerned as well with real intensity about threats to the vice president, which also bothers Republicans. Support from white supremacists who endorsed the January 6th attack bothers Democrats, independents, and Republicans. 
promised pardons for violent behavior by these Democrats, independents, and Republicans, encouraged and supported the attackers, and blocked the FBI investigation. Blocking the FBI investigation, particularly concerning uh, to Republicans who really like the FBI. On a second tier are paying for trips, sharing confidential information, calling the people involved patriots, making a statement in support, and helping spread uh, lies about the outcome of the election or trying to overturn the election. But particularly intense are threatening the vice president, supporting white supremacists who endorsed the January 6th attacks, promising pardons, encouraging and supporting the attackers, and blocking the FBI investigation. If you look at the next slide, um, people overwhelmingly want to hold them accountable. 51% of the public says they want to hold members of Congress and candidates for Congress accountable if they were involved or supported the January 6th attacks. That includes 80% of Democrats, 57% of independents, and even 18% of Republicans who say they want to hold people accountable. Only 18% of the public says move on, and only 13% of the public says that there was nothing done wrong here or that people were patriots. Even among Republicans, only a third say that there was nothing done wrong or the people involved were patriots. If we look at the next slide, in terms of uh, people are very clear and about what kind of punishment they are interested in. And we listed a whole host of punishments and you can see here uh, solid majorities of the public, including universally among Democrats and two thirds of independents say they want it entered into the public record so people know who did something wrong. They want uh, members of Congress removed from committees they're on. They want them prosecuted for committing a crime and participating in a criminal conspiracy. They want them barred from running for future office and they want them kicked out of Congress. And that reaches a third of Republicans and universally all Democrats and a solid majority of independents as well. And if we look at the last slide, what does this say? Well, first off the bat, these attacks on the Capitol and the events leading up to them and afterward, very salient and very negative to voters. And that includes Democratic base voters and independent swing voters. People have heard of the attacks and they think of them as a potential attack on our country. They don't think of it as a few people gone awry um, or a few people um, at the Capitol. They think of it much more broadly. They see the actions on January 6th as crimes they want punishment and they want to hold accountable both the attackers and the politicians who encouraged or supported these attacks for the events before and after January 6th. Large numbers of voters, including independents and Republicans, say they are less likely to vote for their member of Congress if they supported the attack. Large numbers of um, actions um, taken by Republican elected officials are concerning to voters, threatening the VP, supporting white supremacists, promising pardons, encouraging and supporting the attacks, and blocking the FBI investigation. And finally, a solid majority of voters support punishments for members of Congress or candidates who encouraged and supported the attack on January 6th, including barring them from running for office in the future and prosecuting them for crimes today. Let me turn it back, uh, Leslie, to you. Thank you, Celinda, and, and, and obviously for this uh, data that I hope everyone will pay attention to. Um, our next speaker is Norm Eisen, who's a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings and executive chair of the state's United Democracy Center. Also the co-author of uh, uh, a very rigorous report that was issued Monday by Brookings called uh, uh, Trump on Trial, the January 6th hearings and the question of criminality. Norm? Thank you, Leslie, and I've just dropped a link to that report uh, in the chat for those who haven't seen it. Um, I'd like to speak about the question, uh, one of the questions that was raised by Celinda's next to last slide, which is the question of criminality. As we make clear in our report, it's a bipartisan report, it includes uh, Don Ayer, among my co-authors, who was a senior 
uh, Bush and Reagan official. As we make clear in that report, the American people's questions about uh, criminality uh, are one of the most important things uh, that we will be looking for uh, as these hearings commence and run through the month of June. We analyze extensively the existing evidence and the law, including applicable defenses, and uh, lay out, if you will, a scorecard for additional evidence that will come in on the uh, possibility uh, principally of three crimes, although we run the gamut and talk about many options. Um, first, um, uh, did Donald Trump and uh, those uh, around him uh, criminally obstruct the congressional proceeding on January 6th. Um, second, uh, that's uh, 18 U.S.C. 1512, by the way, federal crime. Second, did they uh, conspire to defraud the United States by, among other things, fobbing phony electors trying to deprive the United States of the uh, genuine uh, candidate who was selected by the American people uh, in their activities in and around, not just that day, but the long run up to January 6th. And third, were there also state crimes, uh, such as those being investigated? And we know there's federal investigations uh, but there's also a very advanced state investigation by D.A. Fonnie Willis in Georgia and Fulton County. Uh, uh, did Donald Trump and those he was working with uh, violate uh, the Georgia criminal prohibitions on soliciting election fraud when Mr. Trump uh, told um, the Georgia Secretary of State on January 2nd, Brad Raffensperger, to just, quote, find 11,780 elect uh, votes, popular votes in Georgia, one more than necessary to win votes that, as we explain in the report, the former president knew did not exist. Um, the uh, answer to those three questions is that there is substantial evidence that those federal statutes and state, uh, the state statutes, there's others besides the one I pointed to, were violated. Don't just take my word for it or the word of our bipartisan authors. I think the report is the most extensive analysis out there. But a federal judge, Judge David Carter, respected federal judge um, in California, has found that Trump and his co-conspirators most likely committed federal crimes. By the way, the crimes we look at in the report include seditious conspiracy. We've seen two of those rare seditious conspiracy prosecutions would be extraordinary as opposed to the more vanilla federal crimes I've outlined to see that. But we just saw more extraordinary charges yesterday. Who knows what these hearings will show? And that's what the American people will be watching. We know they care about it. We certainly care about it as analysts. We hope you'll care about it. That as these hearings unfold, we lay out in the report, uh, uh, Judge Carter said, most likely. We go beyond that to lay out the substantial evidence, and we think hearing after hearing, starting with Thursday night, we are going to see additional new evidence, live witnesses, witnesses on tape, some of those over a thousand witnesses, over 140,000 documents, and that the committee is going to add to the accumulation of evidence. It's already substantial. There's already a basis to say a federal judge has found likely crimes. Now we are gonna be watching as that evidence accumulates. For more, I would direct you to the report, uh, which enumerates the other individuals who may be charged, which goes through the facts. Uh, one important thing for you to keep in mind as you look at the hearings on Thursday, as we study what is gonna be a large flow of information coming out of the hearings. And we're gonna be with colleagues, we are gonna be publishing a running scorecard, which we'll share with all of you. We're starting with substantial evidence of, evidence of crimes, crimes that likely occurred. How does the evidence build even further with each successive hearing? But 
The key thing to remember, people often say, oh, this is a tough case because of Trump's intent. One of many things I hope you'll take away from the report, no, this is not a tough case. Because if you look, for example, at that Georgia tape, so important to both state and federal prosecutors, no matter what you may believe, you are not allowed to take the law into your own hands. And if you know those 11,780 votes are there, you can't do vigilante uh, electoral counting any more than you can any other form of vigilante justice. Intent is not relevant to that, but as we make clear, there is overwhelming proof that Donald Trump and his enablers knew full well that he did not win the election in Georgia or anywhere else. Thank you, Leslie. Happy to answer questions later. All right, let me now turn it over to Lisa Gilbert, who, as I mentioned before, is the Executive Vice President of Public Citizen, and who, over the last several years, has put together, led, and inspired the uh, coalition of groups, both in Washington and around this country, that have focused on this myriad of issues. Lisa? Thanks so much, Leslie. I'm happy to be with everyone today. Uh, as Leslie said, I'm Lisa Gilbert, Executive Vice President with Public Citizen, and Public Citizen co-chairs the Not Above the Law Coalition. Uh, the coalition's mission is to ensure that in this country, no person, no matter how powerful, is above the law. And as we've been discussing, the Bipartisan Select Committee is ready to share the results of its rigorous investigation with the American public. And regardless of political party affiliation, anyone who cares about the future of this country should plan to watch. And so, as the televised hearings begin on the 9th, Thousands of people nationwide are planning to join nearly 100 watch events to do just that. These events are being organized to watch the presentation of the collected evidence proving that Donald Trump and his allies engaged in criminal conspiracy to try to overturn the election. The Not Above the Law Coalition is assisting in channeling the activist energy for these events. And the watch events are happening everywhere, in cities across the country, in Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, Wisconsin, and many more and will take place amid attempts by former President Trump and his allies to produce counter-programming as the evidence comes out in the hearings. We will be out there. Uh, the events range from big outdoor movie style, like a flagship event happening in D.C. on a jumbotron at the Taft Memorial on the Mall, to small gatherings in people's living rooms, union halls, and schools. And members of the public are gathering to watch these hearings to underscore the message that MAGA Republicans' attacks on our democracy are not flying under the radar. People get Get that this is a criminal conspiracy that has been unfolding for more than a year, and they are anxiously awaiting the hearings as they know that they deserve all the information concerning how this attack on our country was perpetrated. People are organizing because they want to prevent future plots from interfering in our elections, because they want to show public engagement and sit with others concerned about the future of our democracy when this additional evidence is unveiled. And these same Americans are planning to encourage their friends and neighbors to watch throughout the hearings and to organize additional events, press conferences, and flashpoints both during and just after the hearings. And the Not Above the Law Coalition is supporting these activists nationwide because we know how critical it is that the public sees and understands these hearings. We have to ensure that those in power understand how much interest there is, how much attention to these findings and next steps that will flow from them there is, uh, because every day that Trump and his enablers continue to escape accountability is a day that the forces trying to tear down our democracy get stronger. And it is clear from the interest in these hearings that the public simply will not stand for that. Uh, thanks, Leslie. Happy to chat more about the events and what we're planning. Thank you, Lisa. Our final speaker, before, um, before we get to your questions, is Isosa Oso, as I mentioned, the Deputy Executive Director of Fair Fight Action, a voting rights group that was put to, uh, founded by Stacey Abrams. Uh, she also leads the organization's pro-democracy <clears throat> reform efforts with a focus not just on policy, <clears throat> but on combating disinformation and strategies on the ground uh, to de-escalate the potential conflicts. Um, she's going to talk to us about what people out, outside of Washington are truly worried about and what they see happening through these hearings. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, in, a, in a healthy democracy, we know uh, the people must be able to choose their leaders. 
and they must have faith in the process to choose their leaders. And these hearings are vital uh, to showing the American people, to showing the folks on the ground that we are willing to defend their right to choose their leaders. Uh, and that in a growing multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy, we actually stand ready to ensure that all eligible um, voters have an equal chance and equal opportunity to make sure that their voice um, is heard in free, fair, and safe elections um, without threats of intimidation, without threats of harassment. And But since the 2020 election and the subsequent disinformation that has been peddled um, and amplified by the former president, we've seen Republican legislators uh, in state uh, uh, houses across the country kowtow to uh, extremely dangerous disinformation and conspiracy theories and use those um, strategies to push legislation restricting um, access to our democracy. The desecration of our democracy on January 6th um, emboldened these purveyors of voter suppression. Um, and we saw in the months that followed uh, increased criminalization of our election officials uh, and increased barriers to the ballot box. Uh, we saw hundreds of bills, as the Senator said, proposed nationwide take aim um, at our elections process and take aim at black and brown voters in particular and in marginalized communities. There are, are few better examples of this than in Georgia where um, black and brown voters continue to turn out in record numbers and made history and, and Georgia Republicans responded by passing uh, the anti-voter bill SB202, a bill that's already led to absentee application rejection rates at uh, seven times higher than we've seen in previous election cycles. Um, on January 6th, our, our, our um, democratic system uh, uh, bent but did not break. And what we know from that day is that our work is not done. Voting rights groups have actually been forced uh, to expand and broaden what voter protection looks like, what the voter protection apparatus looks like um, since January 6th. We had to, we've had to establish new strategies, new programs to combat disinformation. We've had to establish new strategies, new programs, new efforts to prevent political violence. We've had to establish new strategies, new efforts, um, new guidance to thwart legislative attempts um, to silence voters. We've had to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars combating and expanding what exactly does it mean to protect our right to vote, to protect our right to um, register to vote, to cast a ballot, and to have that ballot counted fairly. Um, as these critical hearings begin to seek truth, seek justice, seek accountability for the attack on the U.S. Capitol, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, that our, 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 our work to defend democracy is far from over, that the folks on the ground are watching, are seeing, are we going to have their back? Are we going to tell them um, that we're willing to, to um, fight for what makes this country great? And I'm so excited to work with uh, Defend Democracy Projects and, and our coalition and allies on the ground that are, are doing the hard work that people are not seeing um, to uh, uh, hold safe elections to ensure we have the resources necessary to push back on these lies and the impact of those lies to, to, to be ready for the criminalization that will ensue. Because at the very end of the day, um, the freedom to vote is, is about so much more than, than uh, winning elections. It is such a hard um, one thing, uh, but the freedom to vote is, is, is fundamentally about the freedom to live. And so I hope that, um, these hearings will be a, a, a vital and important step in making sure uh, uh, that we are continue to give voters um, the, the, the protections they deserve. Thank you, and, uh, and thank you for all the work. You do it every day. I mean, what, what, the, what we know is that things have gotten worse on the ground uh, every day since January 6th, as horrific as that was. Um, and as well organized as that was, we're seeing even better organization, unfortunately, from those who want to keep us from being able to choose our own leaders. Um, the events or the plans in Michigan that we've heard about just in the last few weeks, another added intensity uh, to the threats that already uh, exist. So um, this is not something in the rear view mirror. Uh, it's not something that anyone in America should uh, shrug off. Uh, the, actually, 
um, people are being emboldened. The, uh, anybody who's looked at the primaries of the last several weeks understands uh, who the candidates are uh, that are now have been selected uh, to run for public office uh, and the threats that they pose. Uh, so with that, let me turn it back over to my colleagues and um, answer some questions from uh, the reporters who've been listening. If you could just raise your hand, we'll unmute you. And then if you also have a question that you would prefer to email in, you can email it to Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E at projectdefenddemocracy.com. And we'll give it a 30 seconds for people hopefully to populate the chat box. Um, Jose. Hi, can you hear me all right? We can. If you could introduce right. yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank, thank you to everyone for doing this. My name is Jose Pellieri. I'm an investigative reporter at the Daily Beast. Um, and my, my question to you is, it's I think it's relatively clear all the ways that the January 6th committee can get this right. My question to you is going to be a little bit more difficult, which is how can they fall short? Well, I, you know, to me, um, the facts as we know them are brutal. Um, and just really giving Americans the chance to unfortunately experience those again and to hear it firsthand um, is powerful enough uh, to make the case that we've described. Um, and so I think really one of the dangers that, you know, is that those on the outside, you know, add sort of expectations and measurements to this that it doesn't really need to meet. Even though we're confident there'll be new information to us, the fact is that unfortunately, uh, it's the American people dwelling in this space is a vicious reminder of what's at stake. But I know my colleagues will have something to add, Norm. Well, um, having experienced one that had um, you know, in spring training of the first impeachment, we certainly had some, some uh, uh, bumped noggins and skin knees, and I'll take more than the fair share. I think the committee has done a very expert job of learning those lessons. Um, if it's not bipartisan, that's a risk, but they have brought one of the most conservative uh, uh, members of the GOP caucus, Liz Cheney as vice chair, and really, according to all reports given to her, a co-equal role in managing this, plus Adam Kinzinger. So bipartisanship is a risk, but they've hedged for that risk. A second risk is not having anything new to say, but the extraordinary investigation, the careful investigation, I and others at time to time, time to time, I know some of you in the uh, my colleagues in the press have sometimes felt a little impatient, but they, I think with, with the over a thousand invest, uh, uh, interviews and the 140, there's going to be a lot of new evidence. And that's so important to get the attention of folks. And so I'm, I know that I'm looking forward to seeing what Ivanka and Jared are gonna say on videotape and many others. And I think I take them at their word that there'll be new information, that's important. And third, you know, if you don't have a, a gripping narrative and as some have said on this call, you don't tell the whole story. This is not a story about January 6th. It's a story about a long run up. And as we've heard from a Sosa, from Leslie, a conti continuing damage that is being done by the big lie, by the election denial. Oh, hundreds of election denying candidates and bills from coast to coast, some of which are making it through the primary process and, and being signed into, or with respect to the bills being signed into law. If you don't tell that full story, that's another risk factor, but they seem poised to do that. So yes, there are those risks, but they appear to have learned the lessons 
and to be hedging the risks. And I'm confident that they are going to do a good job. The last thing I'll say is it's not just on the committee. It's on all of us when what we learn as Americans, what we learn to, to take action against these. This is not a partisan issue against these individuals who are so outside the usual bipartisan mainstream who are promulgating the big lie in election denial around the country. And ultimately, it will be on prosecutors. What will they do? You've heard the substantial, the overwhelming. A federal court has already said there are likely crimes. There's a special grand jury in Georgia. I must say I have some confidence in the American people and in prosecutors as well. So I'm a congenital optimist, but I think those risks are hedged. Hey, Leslie, if I could chime Please. in a little bit. Um, I, I, I come at this from a little bit different angle as somebody who has not only faced voters, but also faced the wrath of voters uh, on a number of occasions. And I think where the committee needs to be very careful and where they can fall down is if they forget the fact that they're fact finders. At this stage of this committee, they should not give the American public the perception that this is a, an attack on Donald Trump. They, they are finding facts. This is truly an attack on democracy. The facts are going to speak for themselves. And, I, and it's very difficult sometimes. I think they have learned so much and you see some of that coming out that it's gonna be difficult for them to walk that fine line of continuing to be the fact finder and not the prosecutor. It is not their job in my view to prosecute. And when you're getting attacked the way Donald Trump has attacked Congresswoman Cheney and Congressman Kinjiger and Adam Schiff and Benny Thompson and everybody else, it's very difficult to set aside that and, and, and continue to be the fact finder. I really believe very strong that it's important for the committee at this stage, they will have plenty of time to help connect the dots. You or the media are gonna help connect those dots. But right now for prime time, they need to lay the facts out there. They need to let the American public see this for what it is. And I, have, like Norm, I have enough confidence in the American people. They're going to connect the dots as well. And that's going to be the most damning tale. So we're, I think that they run the risk of falling down some is if they go into this with their opening statements as an attack on Donald Trump. Uh, and that's going to tune a lot of people out, even people that are persuadable will get tuned out a little bit on that. So that's that's my view coming from a little bit more of the middle of the road. <laughs> I appreciate all that. I know we're going to one, we have more questions. I, I just hope that this is not um, going to be about performance art or about the TV critics looking at that. That's to, not totally what agree. this is about. I know my colleagues agree that is because this is, I mean, really, if people, you know, I had the misfortune of watching hundreds of hours of video over the, fall. And you don't really need to know more than what we already know to understand the threat. And if we, you know, by people paying attention and being forced to live this, explain it to their kids, um, we, you know, that, that is, I think, power enough uh, for action to take place. Um, and I hope that everyone will keep that in mind. And as Selinda's polling has shown, people are already there. Um, and so it's really a question of bringing it forward for them. Um, Let's go to the next question. Uh, Zach Cohen. Go ahead, Zach. Can you hear me okay? We can. Sure. Excellent. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, I want to follow up on the, the polling Solinda presented and um, something Senator Jones just said. To what extent, if at all, do you all think that the insurrection on January 6th or the broader effort to decertify the 2020 election is actually going to factor into voters' minds when they go to the polls in November, especially given all of the other issues that are on their minds. So I think there are a couple of answers to that. And um, my main answer is much more than people think. Um, it's not that January 6th is the number one issue on voters' minds. I mean, if you pulled on that, it would be uh, rising prices and inflation. But I think there are three things. First of all, this is very energizing to surge voters and the new midterm voters, the voters who voted in 2018 midterms, but had never had any previous midterm. They're really angry about it. They're really motivated about it. They're quite knowledgeable about it. I was shocked. 
when they truly believe that it was an attack on the country and that it is very possible to have uh, happen again. And they think these uh, politicians that are running out of this Trump or MAGA faction are uh, absolutely disqualified. So it's very motivating, much like we saw Trump was motivating in 2018. We need to energize our voters. The Republicans are supercharged. We're having some problems with enthusiasm as the in-party always does in the first midterms. We need to charge up our voters. And I think this has the potential to charge up just like we saw in 2018, which had the highest midterm turnout we've ever seen in history, ever, ever. Um, the second thing is it is remarkably salient to independent voters, uh, quite frankly, far more than I would have thought it would have been. And it is a clear distinction. A lot of the other issues are really muddled for them, but this is one of the issues that's really clear to them. It's a real A-B choice. Um, they think it was an attack on the country. They describe it in focus groups as the only crime named in the constitution. Um, and they, they think it's an outrage that elected officials or politicians could get away with it because they think if I did something like this, I would never get away with it, nor should I. Uh, they firmly believe it's a crime. They watch a lot, a lot of law and order and they think the crime should be prosecuted. So I think it's one of those unique issues that helps shift this from a referendum to a choice. I think it motivates our side and it is surprisingly powerful. Anyone else wanna answer or add anything to that? Okay. Um, just say that it may appear that there's a tension between some of the perspectives on coming to conclusions and personalizing it too much as the Senator said and Celinda's view of the demand uh, of the American people, but there's not. They hit, the committee needs to make clear that there are a set of questions, including profound questions about criminality. That's why our report is called a guide to the one six committee and the questions of criminality. And then they need to answer those questions honestly, directly, without fear or favor. So uh, that is what I think the American people want to hear. They don't want them to be biased in one direction or another, but there is a mountain of evidence of criminality here and a federal judge who has found as much. Thanks. Uh, thanks after your question. Um, I think I know we have at least one in the uh, chat um, and maybe some others. Steve, Steven Rosenfeld wants uh, to know, can Celinda talk about the states of mind of Republicans who still believe the insurrection was somehow patriotic? Do you see any indication that they might be open to new emotions about what happened? I don't think they are, but they're only about a third of Republicans. It's a really good question. Um, and what's much more interesting is the fifth of Republicans who actually think this was a crime and that it is a problem and it should be punished. And then the next proportion of Republicans, about another 20% who think um, if crimes were committed um, and things like trying to threaten the president, vice president or uh, fight the FBI is a crime, um, then they think that should be punished and they think people should not run. Uh, so I think there are about 44% of Republicans who are open, they don't tend to be the ones that think these were patriots and that kind of stuff. But um, they are uh, a lot of younger Republicans, a lot of Republican women actually, as well. Thanks, Linda. Um, I think we have another uh, question in the chat. Uh, we'll start, I think first we've got a live question. So why don't we start with that? Uh, Isaac, you wanna go ahead? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you guys can speak to, and uh, Celinda, your findings about people wanting prosecutions here, uh, where the rest of you think that that means that um, the Justice Department would need to be moving forward on this and Merrick Garland would need to be in making the determinations that he has to make. Obviously, we've yet to see what happens in what, what comes out in these hearings, but as, as we do and what we've seen already, uh, what's your opinion of what, what prosecutions need to be made or prosecutorial decisions? 
Norm or Doug, either of you want to take that first? You know, look, I, I think it's very difficult to say. I, you're, we're seeing, and as Norm, I think, has alluded to earlier, uh, evidence is piling up about uh, prosecutions uh, and, and potential po prosecutions. I think the Justice Department is moving. They're not moving as fast as a lot of people would like, but given my experience with the Justice Department and, and, and investigations of this size and magnitude, in fact, there's never been an investigation of this size and magnitude by the DOJ. They're moving fairly expeditiously and they're doing it the way that you would think. They were starting with the, for lack of a better term, the low hanging fruit with those that are at the Capitol and they've started moving up. Just yesterday, we saw new indictments involving uh, the Proud Boys. We've seen that of the Oath Keepers and it's some very, very serious uh, charges. Um, and if they're looking at things going on before January 6th, as well as uh, after January 6th, you can count on the fact that they're not done. And I think that these hearings will help them shed light. That people have to remember that what the Justice Department does is a lot different. They do not have the same transparency that the January 6th committee does. And so I think that um, they start stepping on each other if they really start overlapping too much. And I think that's one reason that the uh, Justice Department is kind of being very methodical. Let these hearings take place they are taking in all this evidence. Trust me, I know them. They're taking in all this evidence. They're assimilating the same, if not more. Uh, and I think we're going to see more indictments. Where that goes, I, I, I don't want to speculate on that at this point because there's a lot of factors that go into the ultimate decision as to whether or not somebody should be indicted. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we also, I think, see this, you know, these hearings is, you know, it's, it's not the end of the process. It's an important part of the process, right. both yes. in terms of the Justice Department and in terms of the American, American people. So um, again, for our standpoint, we're, we don't believe that there are uh, sort of cliffs in this. There's just, there's steady uh, progress in education. This is, um, you know, this is, we need to accumulate information from the American uh, people. Um, and that's what I think these hearings will um, will do. I also think Celinda had just interesting, you know, just to, to comment on her points is I think we all have a tendency when we look at, you know, sort of the impact on things on the electorate to look for something that's going to deliver you a 10 point swing. That doesn't happen. Um, elections are close. Um, people's decisions are made up on more than one thing. Um, and so, you know, this, I think, you don't. Know, there's, we often, I know I do this, we help create a false bar for what one individual issue or concern is going to do for the electorate. And I think that's, you know, that's asking too much of any of those one things, because, you know, think of ourselves as people and how we make and how we make decisions. Um, and I think this other point that Celinda made about energy is also quite important. What we see the Republicans doing is, is, is driving deeper into their base at every opportunity they can get, hugging the base. You know, maybe some of them try and put a pillow between them uh, and, and somebody in Donald Trump, but that's as good as it gets. So I think that um, what we're also going to see is that the that is that people are the Republicans who've won these primaries, who start off hugging Donald Trump, um, you know, are just going to find themselves having to get you know, deeper and deeper into this conspiracy, uh, and that's going to be problematic for them um, uh, as they go forward. Uh, I don't know if we have any more questions. We have one more question in the Q&A from Jackie Combs. Um, she's interested in Celinda and any others reconciling the polling data showing that by significant margin, Democrats, Republicans, and independents want people involved in or supportive of the insurrection to be held accountable with the fact that two thirds of congressional Republicans voted to deny some states electoral votes hours after the riot. Many will be reelected re or win higher office. Many still refuse to call out Trump and others who say the race is stolen and the party will likely win control of Congress. So reconciling those two points. Well, first of all, uh, I quote um, um, Senator Barbara Mikulski who used to say, the reports of my demise are premature. 
Uh, I wouldn't say that um, there are structural features that are big in terms of the election and any off year election for any in party. And I'm not uh, diminishing those, but I think there are a number of factors. This is one of them. The Roe v. Wade decision is another. There are a number of uh, things that are accumulating that could change the direction uh, of those elections. And the elections are far from determined. And uh, that's, you know, the Republicans are certainly not uh, pretending that everything is done and won. Um, they're fighting very, very hard, just spending records amount of money. Um, there's gonna be $6 billion worth of advertising spent at least $6 billion is a lot of advertising. Um, and that can change things. So I think there's um, a lot of discontent out there. And I think that um, the party that addresses that discontent and that sets up the best choice is going to be the winner. But I think it's far from over. Um, and I think this is turning out to be a factor. The other thing that we've seen is that this issue of January 6th connects to other issues in the public's mind. It doesn't connect to every issue. Like we tried to connect it to economic policy and people said, no, that's entirely two different things. But people did think it connected to things like Roe v. Wade, to voter protection, um, which Sosa mentioned, to um, marriage equality and other laws that are established to interracial marriage. And people said, this is a slippery slope. Uh, this is a start. Um, this is a real agenda that they have. And this is a series of actions where they are overturning the will of the people. And that theme of overturning the will of the people is something that voters will respond to very strongly. So I think these hearings, the number one thing that the public wanted was to see publicly exposed what's going on and then to hold the elected officials accountable. And I think they're going to get a real eyeful in these hearings. Can I, I, I want to add one thing because I'm a little bit more cynical about this, I think mm -hmm. because, um, I just see a bunch of damn gerrymandered districts in which a lot of these House members who voted to decertify and not certify electors have virtually no opposition. Um, and, and at least this year, you know, but, but I don't want to diminish the work of the committee and what we're trying to do for the long term. This is not just about the 2022 elections, folks. This is about the long term health of this country and democracy. And if the more facts come out, it may be too late in some districts, many districts, um, to have a real impact this go round. But for the long term effect, uh, people should not forget uh, wh what's going to come out of this committee. And they need to be reminded about it as they go forward. And people need to be called uh, on the carpet about it as we go forward a little bit. So um, th that's my take. I think gerrymandering in this country is a serious problem. Um, and when, when these folks only have to face a very small percentage of the total voters in order to get uh, elected um, and get their nomination, which is tantamount to election, we got a problem. And, uh, and hopefully this committee and the findings in this committee can help start to turn that Titanic around. Um, I just want to ask, my, I think we have uh, uh, run out of time. Our listeners have been patient, but I want to be sure that uh, any, uh, any of the panelists uh, who uh, want to add something have a chance to do that. I had just been quickly about to add that I, I completely co-sign the opinions Linda put out there that these issues are, are connected, that we don't know yet how the information, the new evidence, the facts that come out in these hearings are going to land with the American people. But we do know and we can show by the, the massive numbers that are turning out to set up events that there's tons of interest. And so it's a story still to be written, sort of how, how it will land, how the information will flow around, and then how it connects to all these other issues that people care about when we get to the election. And then the next election, I think it's just too soon to tell. Um, but we, but I anticipate that the attention people are paying will will make a difference in, in how the information flows around the country. I want to see if it's so, so do you want to have the final word? I absolutely agree. I think um, uh, uh, we see all the time that opinions and values are, are, are different. And our, our, a lot of times our job is to, um, can we connect people's opinions at that moment to their values um, overall? 
And when we can connect those opinions to, a, to an actual value, we can uh, uh, um, uh, get people to turn that into action, get people to, uh, to, to, to change the, the way that they vote. And this hearing is an opportunity, like have we made democracy a value and a strong value that people understand, that they care about, and that they will um, um, vote for and vote on. And until we do that, the opinions that they may have on one issue or another um, may not actually sway them to vote um, uh, differently. But as I've said before, uh, this is extremely important to, to get right. There's going to be a wave of disinformation immediately. Um, it's important that we can keep our heads above water, that we can push people to the correct information, um, uh, that we do not turn disinformation into debate, um, and that we can we can uh, uh, protect democracy, not just for 2022, but moving forward. Thank you. And as Osa said, there, are, you know, it's often when things are being taken away that people realize how hard they fought for them. And that's the community I know that she spent a lot of time on and with. Um, so I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank all my colleagues for uh, joining us today. And uh, we'll all watch television uh, starting Thursday night. Thanks, everybody.